is the difference from snitching and being a concerned citizen. Make the call, y'all. Make the call, y'all. The streets stay violent if we remain silent. So make the call, y'all. Make the call, y'all. We can't be afraid. We praying for better days. Make the call, y'all. Make the call, y'all. It ain't up to the police, it's up to you and me to make the call, y'all. Make the call, y'all. It's a difference from snitching and being a concerned citizen. Make the call, y'all. Make the call, y'all. The streets stay violent if we remain silent. So make the call, y'all. Make the call, y'all. We can't be afraid, we praying for better days. Make the call, y'all. Make the call, y'all. It ain't up to the police, it's up to you and me to make the call, y'all. Make the call, y'all. It's a difference from snitching and being a concerned citizen. Make the call, y'all. Make the call, y'all. The streets stay violent if we remain silent. So make the call, y'all. Make the call, y'all. We can't be afraid. We praying for better days. Make the call, y'all. Make the call, y'all. Hello and welcome to Make the Call, the program that wants you to do your part to assist the East Palo Alto Police Department in solving cold murder cases. I am Judge Ladaris Cordell, the host of Make the Call. I got my start as a lawyer in this community here in East Palo Alto. East Palo Alto has been a major part of my life. Just like you, I want this city to be safe for all who live and work here. And just like you, I want murderers brought to justice. And that's what Make the Call is all about. On today's program, we will profile two murder victims, two people who were brutally killed, one in his own home. It is my hope that you will be outraged by the circumstances of their deaths, that you will be deeply moved by the words of their family members, and that you will be motivated to speak up and make the call if you have any information about the people who committed these murders. The first victim profile is of Parma Sunny Maharaj. Detective John Norden of the East Palo Alto Police Department will give us information about the murder. Detective. Thank you. On May 14, 2010, just a few minutes before 11 o'clock, the East Palo Alto Police received a call of a shooting on the 200 block of Gardenia. When the officers arrived, they found a man suffering from a gunshot wound to the head in the garage of his home. Uh, paramedics pronounced him dead at the scene, and uh, very little information was received thereafter. Um, what we did find out was that there was possibly two or three people in the area of the home, maybe near the entrance to the yard at some time immediately after the shooting, and possibly somebody down at the street corner uh, near the home. Um, but uh, we have not been able to find any witnesses thus far. Thank you. Uh, Yashu Chaudhary is the nephew of Sunny Maharaj, and Reshni Chaudhary is his niece. And both of them are here to talk to us about their uncle and how his death has affected them and their family members. So thank you both for coming on to make the call. Thank you. So um, how did you find out, how did you get the news about uh, your uncle's death? Rashi? Um I was actually studying. I was going to San Francisco State at the time. And my sister called me right as it happened because my <coughs> aunt called her, she, my, they live about a few houses away, and my aunt called her before she called 911 because she was, you know, in a panic. And your she aunt meaning your, your my uncle's aunt, wife? My aunt, month's wife, right. um, my aunt Shushila, called, and she told my sister that I think uncle's, my uncle's been shot. And so my sister called me right away as she was running down the street. And where were you? Um, I was in San Francisco. So I immediately. What did she say to you? She said, Fufa in Hindi means uncle. She said, Fufa's been shot, Fufa's been shot. What did you do? I started crying. <laughs> I started crying. And um, it's hard. Yeah. It's just so hard. And, and, Rish, and uh, Joshu, how, how did you find out? Um, well, that night I was actually out playing pool with a few friends. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just got there, it was about 10 minutes. And I walked in, we were playing pool. 10 minutes passed by and I got a phone call and I picked up the phone call. It was my sister and she was all, Th This sister home. here? Or no, same other sister. a middle sister, same yeah. So she called you and what did she say? She tell? called me and she told me that I need to get home now. And I was all like, what's going on? And I thought something happened to our father or something. And she's all like, she goes, well, Fufa's been shot. 
And I, I didn't believe it. I was like, no, nah, that's not possible. And then she's all like, no, he has. And I was all like, no, nah, I don't believe it. So we hung up the phone. I got in the car and I got to East Palo Alto. And I run up and I park my car and I don't run down the street because they live right down the street from us. And when I get there, there's tape everywhere, of course, the yellow tape, yellow caution tape. And, you know, they wouldn't let nobody go through until we're all like, no, we're family. And they let us go through. And once I got there, I, st I still didn't believe it until I actually wa walked up and it was my uncle's body, you know? You actually saw, saw him. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So how, so how has his death affected you all? I mean, I can see it's affected you now, but in terms of this was a year ago, almost yeah. to the day. Yeah. Um, so how, how have things been? Go ahead. It's been really hard. I think that as time has gone by, now our family can talk about it. And it was hard to talk about it It was at very first. hard to talk about it at first. I think everyone was in shock. We were very close to him. My wedding was uh, just a few weeks away, and he was hosting the reception. Oh yeah, and uh, he was actually, just an hour before that, he was at our house. He was helping my parents remodel the house. And um, he had just gone home to get a few tools from his garage and come back. And there was like a gathering at our house. The temple was over to organize a few things. Right. And uh, so, I mean, it was, it was very hard because when we were very close to him and too, he was helping so much with my wedding. Right. Um, so that was, that was oh. very difficult. Um, and, you know, he was the type of person that always, I mean, he didn't know the word no. He always, if you needed him, he would help you. You know, and if, you, if there was something that needed to get done, if there was something that you just didn't know and you called him, he could, especially to his nieces and nephews, because, you know, they, my aunt and uncle, you know, didn't have children, so they took us as their right. own, you know, right. so they're just like a mother and father figure. Right. So wow. it was, um, it's been very difficult. It's been difficult for my parents, all my aunts and uncles, they were all very close right. to him. Right. And uh, so it's now that we can speak about it, right. it's been easier. Right. So you, you, you talked a little bit about how he was always there for you all. Yeah. And then just never said no, he was helping you through wedding. What, what else can you tell us, tell the viewers here about your uncle? Yeah. What kind of personality did he have? Was he a quiet guy? Was he? <laughs> no. Nah, <laughs> definitely wasn't. But Not what a was quiet he, guy. What was he like? Yeah. He was always joking around, all yeah. the time, no matter what. Whenever I see him, you know, he'd mess with me. Like, oh, it's your girlfriend. <laughs> like, uh, no, nah, you know, I was young then, but. He was, he was a really good guy. He, he inspired me to become a mechanic, of yeah. course. And, and that's what he did? Is that yeah, what he he, did? he's actually a jack all trades. But really? yeah, he was a... So there was nothing he couldn't do. Yeah. Really? He was a carpenter. Yeah. He was a gardener. I mean, anything <laughs> really? you yeah. think about it, he did. Yeah. He, he would fix everybody in the neighborhood's things. Yeah, yeah. Right. that's yeah. how you got yeah. Everyone knew in the neighborhood. Everybody. Like, you could just give him a call and just tell him really? something's wrong, and he'll be there, and he'll just fix it. Mm. Like, wow. no problem. Wow. Yeah. I, I think we have, I know we have some photographs yeah. of your uncle. Yeah, this photograph's actually really funny because uh, he did not like to take pictures, and my aunt had to persuade him Forced for, him actually for to so go. long <laughs> to finally. And it's a lovely photo. And it's, it's actually, just lovely. It's, you know, it's, it's a it's a much more recent. Twenty second wedding anniversary. Yeah, it was their twenty second wedding anniversary, and it's, it's actually the most recent picture. Wow. Um, and he looks good. <laughs> yeah. Let's see if we have another photo. Yeah. And oh, that's he's he a little bit younger. Yeah, this yeah. is right? just probably right. a few years after my aunt and uncle were married. That was and how, how long were they married? About 20 years. 20 years. Mm -hmm. Wow. And let's see if we have any other 24 uh, years. photographs. 24 years mm -hmm. of marriage. And here's another. Oh, actually, yeah, that's, uh, that's my uncle. And next to him is my dad, so my aunt's younger brother, my dad's brother. Mm -hmm. um, and this was at an engagement for a cousin of ours. Yeah. And uh, was just, he was just sitting there. Probably, that smirk on his face is probably because he was making a joke. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he hated he, taking yeah, pictures. He was a funny guy. He was, is that right? Pictures, really he just funny. He really made you, like, you laugh. You yeah. <laughs> I think we have one more. Yeah. If there's one more photo coming up here. We'll see. Yeah, I guess, is that the same event? I think it's the same event. Wow. Yeah. There he is. Wow. So your, your uncle was, was how old then when at the time he was killed? He was 50, 50 years old. 50 years old. Yeah. Mm -hmm. wow. So, the, you know, the, the tough question is that there must be somebody right. out there who knows something. Right. And that's why we have this program, right? So if that person <coughs> or those people are watching this program, what is it you, what is you want to say to them? I want you to say it now as, as if, because maybe they're watching this program. Right. What do you want those people to know who may know something about your uncle's death? I think that 
there's no way that no one knows. I mean, there were people, as you say, the people came forward, and there were people standing around, and I just don't know how someone can go on knowing in their conscience that they took someone's life and not come forward, and that, you know, when you do something, if the person who did this, if when you do something, you don't think about the ripple effect, all the people that it hurts in the process. Right. And I think that um, they must have family. You know, if someone was taken from their life, that meant something to them. It's devastating. Right. You know. So, so if, if, and even if the shooter doesn't come forward, there are probably other people who know. Definitely. Right. Yeah. So, you know, Yashu, what, what do you say to them if they're watching this program right now? The witnesses are around if they're watching this program. I'd wish they'd step forward, you know what I mean? It would really help our family come to peace. And also just to know that, you know, if this happened to you or your family and you knew someone knew, it would be the right thing to do. It would be the right thing to, to let someone know. You know, you don't, ha like they've been told, you don't have to come, you can say it anonymously. It doesn't have to That's be right. that you t say who you are, but, right. and I know that make the call this isn't the first episode. You know, there are so many people like this all over, right. especially East Palto, right. who've lost someone. Exactly. And if someone could just come forward and help these families out, right. and just exactly. like our family. You know, as, as the viewers can imagine, uh, the murder of Sonny Maharaj was especially traumatizing to his wife, Shushila, who was there when her husband was shot. And Shushila is here in the studio, but she's just simply unable to talk about all of this. So our hearts, go out to you, Shashila, and our pleas go out to all of you to make the call if any of you have any information about the killing of Sunny Maharaj. I thank you both for coming on this program, and I remind people, please make the call, 1-888-MURDER-0. Please make the call. Thank you all so much, and it is our hope that with the help of officers or detectives like Detective Norton uh, and with you all getting the word out as we're doing also with this program right. that that someone will come forward and this murder will be solved. But thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. That's what it's about making the call 1-888-MURDER-0 or text. That's right. You can now text a tip by texting your information to this number 650-409-6795 you can send an anonymous tip from the Make the Call website. This is a new website, www.makethecalltv.com. When you visit the website, you can send in an anonymous tip. And you can view all of the victim profiles featured on all of our programs, and you can watch past episodes of Make the Call. Take a look at this. East Palo Alto Police have created a new website for its television series, Make the Call. The TV series gets you acquainted with families of homicide victims and with people in the community who are serious about positive change. The website lets you watch our program, get vital information, and participate in new ways of solving crimes. Here's the address, makethecalltv.com. We want to show you some of the main features you'll find on the site. Victim Profiles is a page that lists people who were profiled on Make the Call. Click on a photo for profile information. Each victim profile page includes a television segment about them. MakeTheCallTV.com archives all of our television programs. The most recent episode can be viewed on the home page. To see previous episodes, select the link, Watch Our TV Program. Each episode is repeated several times on local cable channels 27 and 28. The schedule at the Cablecast schedule link contains current programs. Another feature of our site is a link to a site called CrimeReports.com, the mapping website where visitors can see where crimes occurred. MakeTheCallTV.com links directly to East Palo Alto. The Crime Report site was demonstrated in Episode 2 of Make the Call. The reason Make the Call exists is to educate, inform, and encourage you to call with any information that might help us solve violent crimes in our community. 
it's easy to remember the phone number, and we provide it here on the home page. There is a special tip number for anonymous texting from cell phones. It receives the content of your message while keeping your phone number and identity private. You can send an anonymous web message by clicking this button from a computer or mobile phone. The button connects you directly to a tip window. The button is found on the home page and on every victim profile page. Please use these tip features whenever you have any information that may help us apprehend violent criminals. Anonymous tips are helping. The more you participate, the better our chances of stopping these crimes in the first place. Thanks for visiting our site. Our second victim profile is of Gabriel Aragin. Detective Nua Lualamaga will tell you the details of the shooting. On April 28, 2010, at approximately 9.30 p.m., East Palo Alto Police Department had received a phone call regarding a shots fired call along the 100 block of Jasmine Way in the city of East Palo Alto. Upon arrival, officers discovered a 20-year-old Hispanic male, East Palo Alto resident by the name of Gabriel Arublin. He had suffered multiple gunshot wounds to the upper torso. Later, medical aid was summoned to his assistance. Fire Department and American Medical Response paramedics had responded and rendered aid. He was later transferred to Stanford Hospital where he later succumbed to his injuries. Currently, we do have an established motive and we are looking into further leads. Thank you, Detective. Jasmine Aragin, Gabriel's sister, and Carla Valencia, Gabriel's sister-in-law, have agreed to join us to talk to us about uh, Gabriel's life and as well as to talk about the trauma of his death. So thank you both for thank coming you. on thank to make you. the call. Uh, so starting with you, Jasmine, um, you're his sister. Yes. Um, how did you find out that your brother had been shot and then killed? It was at night. Uh, I had gotten off work. I got home, and a friend came to my gun door saying that um, he thought Gabriel got shot. Gabriel got shot. So mom, he gave my mom a ride, and then uh, me and my husband got in the car, and we drove to the scene. And what did you? What happened when you got there? And when we got to the scene, like we couldn't really get in, so I ran out my 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 car barefoot. And then we ran over there, but they had already taken them to the hospital. So your brother was gone when you got there? Yeah. And were there still police there, a lot of people yeah, there? Yeah, there was still the police there. And then what happened? What did you do then? So then from there, we, I went back home, and I grabbed my daughter. And then they had told us that they were already at the hospital. So then we drove to the hospital. And then we're, what? And then so we're waiting, and then finally uh, um, a doctor came out and was like, oh, that he died. So then we just... Uh, like we were shocked at first, and then that we just all started crying. Everybody what, was your mom there? My mom, his friend, all his friends were at the really? at, at the hospital, just like crying, bawling out. Like, why did it happen? Like, it was just shock. Like you wouldn't think, cause that the day before I was with them, and we had went to go buy some cookies for my mom, and then this is like shocking that you can't believe it. You're in shock. So one day he's there, and the next and day he's, he's just gone. gone. And, and how old was your brother? He was uh, 20 years old. Just 20? Yeah. Wow. He's a year younger than me. Wow. And uh, Carla, how did you find out? Well, Ishmael's my husband, Gabriel's brother. He, Edward called Ishmael and told him, oh, Gabriel got shot. So my husband just thought, oh, you know, it was probably like to his leg or right. something simple that not serious not mm -hmm. serious he but he'd still rush to the hospital and I stayed home with my children and um, then Ishmael called me that he was there waiting for them to come out and say stuff but I had a bad feeling really so I asked my grandma to watch my children and I asked my brother to rush me over there and I got there and when I got there they came out and said that he was gone so, I, I mean, and this is probably you know a, a very. I, I think I know the answer, mm -hmm. but I think I, I wanted you to tell me in your own words what has it been like, knowing that your brother, brother-in-law was, was was murdered. It was uh, well for me. It was familiar? shocking. It was hard. Like as when I was on the way to the hospital, like I felt like he had asthma, so I was like, 
like I can't breathe. I was, I was telling him I was like something. I was like he. I was like he, he's like I felt it. Like I was like like wheezing, and I was like something's wrong. Something's not. So it was like I don't know. It was just hard. Like were you real close to your brother? Oh well, yeah. He was always a young. We were always together. Like I would take care of him. He would take care of me. He had problems at school. I was like a brother kind of. Right. So I'd like take care of him. Right. I don't. We were just always together in pictures. We have a lot of pictures together. We were close. He was a loving brother. He was there for me, my daughter. Like Right. So ta you just mentioned pictures. There are a lot of pictures of yes. you and your brother. We have some photos mm -hmm. of your brother here. So why don't we take a look at some of the photos. And you tell me, what, what's happening in that photo? You see it up there? This is his graduation. And He was receiving his diploma there. And was from where? From Terabella High School. Wow. Wow. He looks happy. Yeah. And uh, I think we have another photo. Who's and that's oh, Gabriel that's on the brother. left. That's his brother. That's Fernando, and that's also at his graduation after when oh, we wow. came out. How many brothers did Gabriel have? It Does was have? it's six of them with yeah. him. Really? Not here. Really? And I think there's one more. There's this was one. at the rehearsal dinner of his older brother Juan, and that's um, in the black. It's my husband Ishmael, his brother, that's and his brother. Jose Eduardo, the youngest of all of them. Wow. And these are all brothers, yes. right? Yes. His brother's there. And I think we have one more photo. Now, what's this? That's the wedding of his brother. That's Juan, his older brother that got married wow. the for the rehearsal. Oh, wow. his, uh, so he, he looks like such a, a mm -hmm. nice young man and, and happy. I mean, what was he like? Tell me. He was nice. The baby he, brother. So he worried about everybody. He worried about her, me. He took care of all of us, his nieces. Like, oh, Gabriel, take us to see the pet store. He worked at PetSmart. So he'd be like, oh, because he loved animals. He had so many animals. Really? Chickens, chameleons. Uh, Any we have a, animal you could think really? of. Really? He had chameleons, like parrots. His, the pit bull we have, it, we had it for so long. Parrots, uh, which I let it out. It flew out. Oh, <laughs> <Wow>. next. <laughs> and it was a, um, yeah. we had every animal, like he had a godfather. Like if he asked him for a, a pet or whatever, they'll buy it for him. We had every pet, rabbits. We, really? Like, I don't know, that made him happy, like nice. animals. So it sounds like he's very caring. I mean, yeah. he cared for pets, he, he cared for you caring. all. It's my everything. mom, like every picture you see, he's always like this with my mom. Really? They're always like, he loves my mom, he took care of her so much. How's your mom doing since all of this? She's shocked, she's sad, like why would they take her son? Like it's any mother, they'll feel bad, like why would you take somebody's son? You have a right. brother, you have a, a, it's your nephew, your, why would you do that? Right. What if that was you or, you right. know? Right. So, you know, the purpose of this, this program, Make yeah. the Call, is that we hope that your story about your brother and your brother-in-law touches somebody who had some information, who knows something, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what, would you, what do you want to say right now to the person or the people who may be watching this program who have some information, who haven't come forward and talked to this detective? If you know anything, uh, if you were there or if you heard something, go to the police, or if you don't have to go to the police, uh, go to the website or make the phone call to, um, yeah. um, just, call, like, don't be scared. Make, don't, you're not going to be a snitch or anything. Just let, the, like, if you know something, call the police or email them or go to their area where they're at and let them know because that was my brother. What if that was your brother? And just we miss them and we love them. We want justice to be served. We want that person to get caught. Right. In, in, in Carla, so what if somebody were to say, well, I know something, but I'm afraid to say anything. Well, well, what do you say to that person? And then maybe that person's watching the show, and they're just afraid. I'm um, sure that person has a sister. What if that was your sister? You would want that person to get the justice. You, what if you lost your sister, your brother, the same way we lost our loving brother? I mean, would you want the same thing to happen to you? You want that person to get caught. You want that person to get caught. So, I mean, it's not something bad that they're doing. They're going to get this person to get justice for what he did. Right. So do you have, um, are there other family members? That, again, I, I want you, I know your mom's not here, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but if she were here, what do you think she would say? She would just <clears throat> want people to come forward. Don't be afraid. She would just want them to, uh, if they know anything, to come go to the police. Like, if they know anything... There's a lot of people out there. I'm sure there was somebody that knows something. They need to come to either Detective Noir or call the hotline or something if they don't want their name to be brought up. And they won't be, if they're afraid because their name's going to come up, it's not going to come up. 
they just police want to know what what's going That's on. That's right, because it can be anonymous. Yeah, it's right. anonymous. You don't even have to say. So, it just must be very frustrating for you all. I mean, it's been more than a year. Yes. yes. And, and his birthday is on Tuesday. His birthday is yeah. coming up, and he would have been twenty-two. And and no one has come forward. And that's that's how crimes get solved, right? Yes. And that's how this murder is going to get solved. It really needs somebody to come forward. So um, I, I know that it's hard for you, uh, the family members, for you all to talk publicly about Gabriel. So I, I thank you for coming forward. And, and hopefully with the help of someone who was watching this program, Gabriel's killer will be brought to justice. So to Jasmine, to, to Carla, Thank you so much Thank for you. Being, having the courage to come forward. And we hope that people out there will have the courage to come forward too and solve this crime. And that's what it's about, making the call. 1-888-MURDER-0 or text. That's right, you can now text a tip. You can do it anonymously by texting your information to this number, 650-409-6700. Six seven nine two. East Palo Alto, it's our community. We're looking out for each other. We don't want violence, and we don't need fear. If I hear a gunshot, if I see weapons, if I know anything about a violent crime, I'm going to take action. This, this is, is my, my community. community. My friends and family depend on it, but. Revenge is not the answer. I'll send an anonymous text or I'll leave a voicemail. It's private and secure. The number is 650-409-6792. There's a website too. MakeTheCallTV.com It lets me type a message. It's a small thing, but it might save a life. So now there are three ways to take action and they are all safe. They're all anonymous. They all help us stop the violence. This past summer in East Palo Alto, we experienced a spike of violence that dismayed and alarmed our community. Before this period, we had seen historic lows in crime and violence, but then tragic events began to unfold. First, we saw the horrific murder of three-month-old baby Isaac. Violence continued over a period of two months with a total of five homicides. Because of the participation of our community members, police were able to arrest suspects and identify persons of interest in all of these cases. You stepped up and made the call that made the difference, and we thank you. Now we turn to a very important event that took place on August 4th, 2011, led by Chief of Police Ron Davis and Mayor Carlos Romero. The community gathered to hear what efforts are being made to reduce violence and to speak out and be heard. I think it's very important to understand that as a community, we've come a long way since incorporation in 1983 and a long way since 1982 when we had that moniker of uh, crime capital, death capital of the country. We are nowhere near that. And our response in the last month as a community and certainly as uh, our public safety officials, as the chief and his department, has been outstanding in the sense that people have been pouring out to give us information. One of the messages we want to get across today is that if you are engaged in criminal nefarious activities in East Palo Alto, and if you decide to perpetrate a crime on anyone in East Palo Alto, resident or not, the community and the police will track you down and you will pay for these crimes. And I think that over the last month, this community has shown it, starting with that tragic but catalytic death of little baby Isaac, when the community said, enough is enough. And within 48 hours, Chief, we had uh, suspects in hand. We had them behind bars. Now, we'll let the DA deal with the prosecutions, but we were able to get there because we had people cooperating. And the only way we can control crime, the only way we can deal with violence in our community is to be engaged. And so uh, toward that end, I want to make it, I want, and I want to highlight and emphasize that for the city council of East Palo Alto, it's not just about 
putting boots on the street. We have a really competent police chief, a very competent police force. But nevertheless, we're not going to solve the crime problem. And the chief says this in national forums. He says it here. You're not going to solve it with just police. We have to solve it with social institutions, with civic society participating and engaging in a meaningful way. I mean, I see Dr. Faye McNear Knox here, Michael Jones from the Boys and Girls Club, Pastor Harris, Pastor Baines, Reverend Fraser, Leif Erickson from Youth Community Service. I could name a dozen organizations that are here that are the bulwark of social institutions in East Palo Alto. We didn't have those 20 years ago. We didn't have them in 92, we have them today. We are a much stronger uh, community and we will continue to persevere and we will continue to reduce crime in East Palo Alto. Obviously this violence should trouble us and we should be very concerned about it as a community. Four homicides in a month, five in two months, uh, is, a, is a pretty high rate. One homicide is too much, but it means something. But if I can ask anything is, hopefully you saw the letter I sent to the community, the message I was sending out today, is stay the course. That when we look at, if you recall, just a couple months ago, we were in here, a much smaller group, but we were in here nonetheless, uh, not celebrating, but acknowledging that we were hitting some historic lows with regards to crime and violence that if you look at the last five years, and then if you look at the last uh, 22 years with the UC Berkeley report, this community has historically, it has continually reduced crime and violence um, at a very consistent rate. So on one hand, we know, I think, as a community, what is supposed to happen, what works um, to reduce violence. We know that it takes a collaboration. We know that it is not the police department by itself, that is the community that has to lead it. We know that we have to focus on prevention and intervention. We have to focus on our youth. We know that it must engage a lot of people. And what I don't want us to do is to get diverted when there is a spike in crime or violence. So we have the spike, we need to respond to it. But what makes our response, in my opinion, extra strong are the systems that are in place before the spike even occurred. Many of the programs that many of you are out here are running have been in place well before the spike occurred. The relationships that we've been forging over the few year, last few years have been in place before the spike. Our multi-agency response, partnerships with local law enforcement, county and state, were in place before. We even had a meeting in June with over 80 representatives to talk about how we're going to track gang activity, not only in East Palo Alto, but throughout the Bay Area. So the challenge for us would be we have to respond to the spike in violence, but we have to stay the course with things that we know will work. And those are the long-term strategic enforcements strategic investments that we have that will better uh, not only public safety but our community. So we have a very large block of time for Q&A to talk about what's working, what's not working, your recommendations, answering concerns you may have. So this is really, we really do want it to be a dialogue so that we can get some idea with the one, I think, consistent goal, and that is to address the issue of crime and violence in our community. I'd like to recommend for the last seven years, a group of organizations have been working on a program called the Sponsored Employment Program, and we put young people to work in the summer. In better years, we've been able to put 100 youth to work in the community uh, and give them mentoring and uh, pay them $9 an hour for 30 hours a week. That program has a proven track record. This year, we were only able to serve 55. One East Palo Alto's philosophy, and like all other nonprofits, we're facing you know, an economy that makes it difficult to do our base programs. Funds are drying up. I challenge the city to create a jobs program for youth. Thank you. It is not enough to let one effort be what it's all about in putting our young people to work. Those se almost 700 young people who have gone through this program are connected to this community. They know us as adults. They know where the organizations are. But one effort is not enough. This city is, has a disproportionately large young population. Right. And the young people have told us, they told us in 2005, if you don't want us to deal with crime and violence, get us some jobs. I'm feeling with this sister, and well, a lot of people in here are feeling, these are our people. And I have been, you're going to funerals now. 
but I did this 20 years ago. So when I came in here, I was pissed off. And I try not to curse, try to be a lady. Um, I was there and said, what are we doing? I mean, what are we doing, y'all? I mean, we're sitting up here pretending. And part of it is true, yeah. My program, I'm the only one. No, I never said I was the only one. I have never said I was the only one. And what I submitted to for, for the crime thing was I submitted a program for outreach workers that would highlight the other programs in this community. You see what I'm saying? Not reinventing the wheel, but the new ones, making sure people knew about it, but having um, outreach workers on the street every day and having the church volunteer some. Just, I mean, one church a week, once a year to, to do outreach. Be out there on the streets to talk with the ones, not the ones in here. We're not shooting each other. You know, out there trying to reach them. And yeah, no, some of them are not going to be. Some of them are hard. You're right. Because um, the, that's part of it. It's a multi-dimensional thing. Fortunately, and I'm going to say this straight up, we have good champions here that know how to get this done on their side. But law enforcement is after the fact. You want to talk about crime prevention? Get a successful school going. Get kids to graduate yes, from high right, school. Yes, right. You want to talk about a job program? program? That's a diploma. That's right. We ended up from Parity. Parity. We ended up from It's a mirror. Did we end the programs? Did we stop the programs? No, our outside funding. Some of our outside funders. We didn't want our kids to be successful. Which is why we came up you know, with our own money. Year after year. Which is why we came up with our own money. The chief has been, year year, the chief is, I've worked closely with the chief on some other things where he does a really good job of matching the Office thing. of Juvenile Justice funding with our goals, with our outcomes that we want to have happen here. Let's look at those other resources. We supposedly have um, our president in the office. He's, he's setting some things up where funding comes down for communities like us. Make ourselves knowledgeable, find out where they are. Work on our strategy right now, which is what we're doing by hearing from you. Because some of some of the things you all said we came up with, but without necessarily the passion, and, and thank God without some of the experiences you all went through, um, I, I really hope that you all find some strength to get through the struggles you have to make. Mm -hmm. But um, just know that we're with you, and we know that our children and our families are at stake too. My number one concern is the youth. Last year, while I was in the process to interview the kids, there were 375 kids that applied for a position. And I just fell in tears because I said, how these kids are so anxious to get a, a job? They need a job. They need things to do. They need to start doing things that keep them keeps them out of the streets. So we need to develop, I think the city, with the, all the nonprofit organizations need to partner and we need to care more about our youth. They need a job. They need things to do. They need things to be involved with, healthy things. So I think that it's time to get together and to start, stop fighting each other to see you are doing this and I'm doing that. Uh, you will not yeah. get that fortune money. Yeah. yeah, get together. We are a very small city and we need to just embrace our races, our future, and see what are we going to do with our kids. Chief, I don't know if you want to say a few words about yeah. Pelton. I think a lot, I will get to a lot of details, but I think a lot of people, um, obviously probably Powell's been around for 40 years, apparently their anniversary is coming up. And actually what I would say is Powell is one of those programs that many people in the community um, approached me with when I first got hired as being a program that we need to restore. The idea of police working with the youth and providing youth uh, after school activities and not just taking their time but also providing developmental opportunities as well. So it was a combination of a lot of work and a combination of uh, a lot of work from the council's point of view is making it a strategic priority uh, and allowing us to actually use our, at that point, our lobbyists to uh, get congressional funding. So we actually had a grant to start the Police Activity League that was specifically earmarked for POW. And that allowed us to build the structure, to create a board, to start some of the programs. And so, but now POW, like any other program, is going to have to sustain itself but we're very proud of it because we think it can provide a lot of opportunities for youth. And not by itself. I think, if I can steal a phrase from an organization, it's more like a continuum of service providers. 
So as we get POW, we may get referrals from the probation department, we get referrals from the school district, referrals from the officers. And that we send many referrals may go to the youth court. And then once they're basically uh, processed in the youth court, they may then turn around and go to POW. They can go to the Graffiti Arts Project or the Mural Music and Arts Project. They can go to a lot of programs. They can go to a golf, golf program. They can even go to, we're looking at chess with the idea of having our kids think about things before they do it. I think it's called Think Before You Move, which really is kind of a, a, a really savvy play on words, but it basically does talk about life, how you need to make decisions. So we, we're very happy about it and think it's one of many programs that the community uh, will have that can focus more on our youth. And hopefully we look forward to uh, many more that we can partner with. We can be successful with youth up to a point, but when there's no parent involvement, somehow, you know, it's just like dropping off a cliff. So I like to see somehow in Measure C that some of those funds maybe be set aside for some type of parent training, some type of support uh, with parents. Because what's happening is we're getting parents that are much younger. And because they are younger, they lack experience. I'm asking these men, step up to the plates. Become mentors to these young boys. But God knows, I have five young boys whose father is doing 107 years in prison that need uh, someone to care about them. And the three-year-old, he's in uh, therapy. The three-year-old, because he's having issues. So let's step up to the plate. Let's get a change going in this community. Let's save our children. These children, the mothers, and the, they're, they're, they're leaving this world before their parents. And it's not right. Nobody has a right to take somebody's life. Only God can do that. Murder, homicide is never good, OK? Now, uh, it's tough to solve those crimes. but. You know, we can help. The community can help solve those crimes. You know, a lot of people know what happened, yeah. when it happened. Amen. Until they start stepping, to, stepping up to the plate and getting rid of those undesirables that's killing and murdering unmercifully, we're going to have this problem on down the road. We're just going to kick the can down the road a little bit. So we got to get to our folks, our relatives, kids out there on the street, they got to help solve these problems. They know who did it. Why don't we have to wait for these things to happen? And I want to know, now that I work with parents, whenever they call me about their kids, you know, going in those directions, where do I send them? Because I'm calling the number that you guys have with the two. I forgot yeah. their names, Veronica. Veronica. Yes, and I never got a response back, so I, I don't know if that parent ever got that help. There is a new, relatively new program, I think, here in the town of San Mateo, but it's throughout the state. It's called 211. And so you can dial, just as you dial 911, you can dial 211, and they will connect you to services that are non police related. Now, um, you, you know, you're, you're going to have to go through that process. I understand from Supervisor Carol Broom that it's now up and running, it's functioning, they're getting the kinks out, but I believe it's actually working and it does do the referral piece that you're talking about. It's not only bilingual, I understand they have a total of 19 languages because they can hook up with other places around the state. So it's very important, keep that number in mind. You're right, we need to figure out how we do the information referral piece a little better. Very well taken. I jotted that down. We'll figure out certainly how we can get the 211 number out. I, I just wanted to implore the, the chief and the mayor. Um, as you know, the governor um, passed, uh, signed AB 109, that beginning October 1st will begin to release um, early, do the early release of, of offenders um, back into community. And um, the planning began yesterday in San Mateo County through the Community Corrections Partnership around how to invest the $5 million that's been allocated for this current fiscal year in order to provide um, re-entry services. Um, again, the very first meeting was yesterday. I think it's critical that East Palo Alto be a part, an active part of the re-entry work that's being planned at the county level because we know that um, we will see a number of those individuals returning back to their families here where we live in our community. And so I know that the other re-entry funding dried up, 
this may be an, uh, an option for some additional funding that we may be able to leverage, but if we're not at the table, we can't you know, and won't be considered. Uh, thank you for bringing it up because that's one of those areas that will slide in and catch us off guard if we're not paying attention and we will get, I'll say it a little stronger, we will get the shorter end of the stick and we'll have the largest amount of constituency that will be affected by it and we'll have pennies and it will perpetuate this whole idea of this recidivism rate. To this day, the East Palo Alto Community and Police Department was still the only police department to ever run a reentry program funded by the State Department of Corrections. To this day, this police department is the only police department that acknowledges the issue of redemption, that people deserve a second chance, and would work more about providing alternatives than putting people in prison. And to this day, that was about a $6 million contract that also put people working on the freeways, making $10 an hour cleaning up litter. I would say that that's community policing. The effectiveness is recidivism rates went from 70 plus percent to below 20 percent. That's pretty significant. That means fewer of our young men, especially young men of color, went to prison. I just wanted to talk about the success stories that have come in East Palo Alto. Chief, I think hey. that the police department is doing the best work that they could because I know the kind of lifestyle that I live. But, uh, and you know, I just wish that our children and the parents could have some kind of accountability for our kids' actions. You know, it's very, very difficult, you know, and I just say to the parents that my hearts go out to you because we can blame everybody, but we know what our kids are doing. And if the parent does not get behind their child and be an example in front of them, Come on, we're going to have meetings like right. this all the time. So we can sit here all day long and ask for a silver spoon to be put in our mouth. You know, IKEA was built. Sweet Home had training classes, and I know that they that many kids did not come by there. And I've been there for 20 years. So parents, I beg you, I beg and plead with you not to blame for anything that happens to our child out there when we know what they're doing because we live there with them. You can't punish them. You know what you do? Ask them a question. Say, what would you like? And if they respond, you say, well, I don't know if I like that or not. The kids, the poor was over here. Every time I pay my bill, you know what I have? An arm full of books. And you know what I have at my house now? A den, library, books everywhere. And every kid comes, they want to come back and they bring their friends and say, come, let's go here. You can build if you want to. You can color if you want to. And the books here to read stories. And I said, all parents read. Let their kids tell you what they like and they don't like. I said, you don't like college, you tell them to go to, like I had one like that. Or his son to go to the big one he went to. And he said, no, he didn't do well. I said, that kid has to tell you what college he want to go to. And now he's doing that. I just want to talk about something positive real quick. Um, tomorrow, 1.30. Um, at uh, Bell Street Park um, and hats off to our city council for creating uh, or providing money and creating another healthy alternative for our children. Um, skateboard Park, a temporary skateboard park at Bell Street Park, uh, we have been talking to about 130 um, skateboarders who, who, you know, ride in East Palo Alto and we wanted to give them a location um, to be at. And so, uh, Council Member of RICA and Vice Mayor um, Laura Martinez really have championed this and been working on it for two years. Um, the small skateboard park uh, center, you know, went from park to park, and now they um, really have uh, supported the youth <coughs> by providing a 5,000 square foot pad and ordering equipment that'll be a temporary park. Please come out and, and you know yell for the kids. It is the groundbreaking, but the t by the 29th, we should have the park completed, the 29th of August. Even more immediate um, solution or uh, opportunity to support young people tomorrow, right across the hallway in the library, we'll be having a graffiti arts uh, project festival, another project, another successful project that was funded um, in partnership with PAL and, and in partnership with the, uh, with the um, department. And I, uh, just my observation here and has been it, witnessing it has been so structural based. It's been on money and, and the politics. Um, but I think another uh, opportunity that we spoke on briefly is just our, our um, 
the opportunity we all can do to shift culture. And culture doesn't necessarily need to be paying money, it can simply be paying attention. Right. And so if we, um, I think tomorrow's a good opportunity to just pay attention to some young people who across all um, neighborhoods and ethnic uh, backgrounds have come together to put up some art. They have, we, um, Chief mentioned earlier that we, that we do have a graffiti problem um, in the city, but uh, we've taken the interest of a lot of young people who have interest in art and have interest in street art, and we've allowed them to have a venue and a place to express it. The library has been generous in offering their location. Um, the, uh, obviously, the, the um, Chief Davis and, the, and Powell has been generous in, in helping to fund it. So I just hope that we can um, pay some of our attention. It's free to come, um, and there's free food in the whole nine, so it, it will be a good opportunity if you can come by and support us tomorrow. A couple things with the program. One, it's been recognized by, I just left a conference with the United States Department of Justice, the COPS office, and it's recognized as a national model on how to engage kids at risk that teach them how to transform their talents, which can be used for destructive behavior graffiti, to positive art and mural and, and the discipline and respect it. And so the COPS office uh, was very much interested in it. It was published in the monthly uh, report, uh, uh, publication by the COPS office. And when we went to the COPS conference with over 1,200, 1,300 attendees from around the country, it was one of the programs highlighted. Uh, as you went through the, you know, the, the areas of the uh, hotel and the conference, is the East Palo Alto um, Graffiti Arts Project. The other thing that was highlighted, quite frankly, because the police department was asked to participate in two of the panels, is the reentry program. And to the point where it just, as we, we, we didn't get into some of the positive, and so this is now just us to, talking about the positive, is that the reentry program is now being replicated in Oakland. They're looking at doing it in Richmond, throughout Contra Costa County, Los Angeles, and across the United States to where they've asked me, I've already been, we've been participating on panels in Florida, D.C., the Justice Department, and everyone's turning to East Palo Alto to see what is this thing that you guys are doing as a community where you're re-entering. Because when you did it three years ago, it was a challenge. Today it's a buzzword, it's a necessity because everybody knows prisoners are getting released by the thousands. Right. And so, once again, I think that's the part of East Palo Alto I think uh, sometimes is not understood and that the community is, and has been doing this since the 90s to transform from murder capital to where we're at today. And sometimes I think, uh, hopefully we can end on a positive, is that it's, um, we do this with all of our, so there's no, no culprits. We all do this. It's easy to focus on the negative, harder to focus on the positive. And so I would hope that the message from me leaving is that uh, we have a spike, we have a significant challenge. Um, but candidly, from my perspective, we as a community have responded very well to the challenge. The core issue, the root causes that cause this kind of challenge remain. And so we can have years that go down to four homicides like last year, which was a 12 year low. We can freeze it for the next six months. We may even go the year after that with zero homicides. But the challenge that remains is that we're still, any given day, from being murder capital. When, a, when you can have someone bump into someone else, and that turned into a shooting, which turned into five shootings, which turns into three homicides in a week, Right. Then these are the things that we challenges we have. So that the, when I say stay the course, we respond to that. We put the task forces in. We got to do all the things we do. But the underlying issue is Measure C and why we probably spend so much time on it. Not just all of it, but the issues. The dis, in some places are dysfunctional families, at risk youth, with a 65% dropout rate. There should be no surprises on why we got some of these challenges. With a 21% unemployment rate. So it's redevelopment, it's business, it's education, it's families, it's domestic violence. Pia, I think they said it right, when they developed Measure C, it was a very brilliant document that those are the core issues. And if we stay focused on that and work with together as a police and a community, I think long term, we will be better off. And we'll get, we'll, we'll have spikes, we'll have challenges, we'll agree, we'll agree to disagree. Um, we will um, sometimes, you know, say things to hurt each other. I'm talking about as a community. But I think one thing, and so I'm gonna make a request before we close it out, is that one thing that even that came out of today, very emotional meeting. It reminds me, for those who were here, remember about 2009, December, we had a little spike. For some reason, that day was like real hot. Everybody was sweating, it got kind of heated. We had to open up the doors. And one thing that stood out, that I think stood out for me, is that we were still at the end of the, at the, end of the day, that we could agree, we could disagree, we could point, we can yell, we can scream, but we were able to hold hands, close in prayer, and we remember that we're a unified community. 
And at the end of the day, the only thing we focus on is saving lives in our community, making us safer, so that you can have the, the, uh, the quality of life that you very much deserve from a public safety point of view. Thank you. Uh, Mother Frazier. Father, we are truly grateful. We thank you so much that we can come together and pray. We've had a lot of discussion tonight. Yes. We want Father God yes. to be able to provide jobs for the young yes. people. Yes. We want yes. to see them educated, Father yes. God. Yes. We want the parents to have jobs. Yes. Father God, we have so much that yes. we need, but we know yes. that as we come together and we talk to one another and try to work with one another, collaborate, Father God, that you are able to cause those things to come about yeah. and so we just ask you to help us to do what we need to do yes. to have peace in our own hearts yes. and come with that peace and share it with others Amen. community collaboration is critical in reducing violence and community is key to improving education and employment East Palo Altans are creative. East Palo Altans are committed to making this city safe and vibrant. This program, Make the Call, shares that commitment with you. As we come to the close of our program, let's take a final look at the two murder victims that were profiled. Gabrielle Araguin, shot and killed on April 28, 2010, and Parma Maharaj, murdered on May 14, 2010. Their families are pleading with you to help solve these horrific crimes. So it's on you now to step up, represent, and make the call, 1-888-MURDER-0, or text a tip to 650-409-6792. You can do it anonymously, or go to our website, at www.makethecalltv.com where you can anonymously send in information and where you see you can also see other victim profiles no one should get away with murder not anywhere and certainly not in our town make the call y'all make the call y'all we can't be afraid we praying for better days make the call y'all make the call y'all it ain't up to the police, it's up to you and me to make the call, y'all. Make the call, y'all. It's a difference from snitching and being a concerned citizen. Make the call, y'all. Make the call, y'all. The streets stay violent if we remain silent. So make the call, y'all. Make the call, y'all. We can't be afraid, we praying for better days. Make the call, y'all. Make the call, y'all. It ain't up to the police, it's up to you and me to make the call, y'all. Make the call, y'all. Make the call. No one should get away with murder.